Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, for those of you who have stepped in late, please post your questions in the questions section of GoToWebinar and not in the chat section. I want to just start off today with a, uh, a few polls to just try to get a sense of you know, why this was a popular topic. We picked SOLIDWORKS tables uh, simply because there's a lot in there. There's, there's a, you know, a lot of options and ways of getting around tables that uh, uh, maybe isn't as intuitive as you would expect. Um, first poll, I'm going to go ahead and launch this. I just want to get an idea how comfortable you folks are with using SOLIDWORKS tables. Now, SOLIDWORKS tables, there's many different table types. So, okay. Give the poll a few more seconds here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And let me just share that data with you as well. Um, you know, it looks like most of you are a little bit comfortable with the, the SOLIDWORKS tables, 50-50 uh, or so. All right, let's uh, try another one here. I want to just get an idea of the types of tables that you folks uh, have created in the past. Now, this is multiple choice, so if you've created all those different types. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because di the different types of tables, uh, you know, will work differently within the software. And uh, the poll's kind of going as I expected here that most people are doing uh, bill material tables uh, once in a while hitting on some of these other table types. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close that. Let me just share the data with you so you can get an idea of what we're looking at here. So most of you are mostly interested in the bill materials, which luckily I do have the most information on today. Uh, one last poll. Um, I want to get a sense of, I know there's some confusion around tables, and uh, I just want to get a sense of why there is a level of confusion. Uh, for me, here are the, some of the things that I've seen uh, as uh, reasons why tables can be confusing from one to the other. This is multiple choice, so uh, go ahead and just pick what you feel is, is, uh, is best here. Okay, we'll give a few more minutes, seconds here. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close and share that with you as well. So it looks like, uh, you know, for most of you it's a cross-section. Some of you, uh, table templates are important. You don't have a good organization method for that. Uh, if you don't use table much, tables much, uh, getting at some of the options and knowing where to pick and click can be tricky. So I'm going to try to take some of the confusion out of that today. Uh, not being able to find the tools to make it work, either it isn't there or it's hard to find. Uh, and then I believe there's a lot of places to click to get what you need uh, in here as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, move on. Now here's the agenda for today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, just real quick intro to tables in SOLIDWORKS, just basic terminology. Some of this stuff will, will seem very, very fundamental to what we're, uh, what we're discussing. I want to make sure I cover A to Z. Hopefully you can pick up at least one or two tips or tricks, even if you are a, a veteran user. Uh, I want to go over table cell role and column toolbars. I want to look at what capabilities are common between all the different table types, things that you can use repeatedly regardless of the type of table. Now I had to break this down uh, and make sure that I covered uh, only a portion of the different tables. There's 10 or so table types now. Uh, the ones that I posted on the GoToWebinar invitation that we're covering today are general tables, revision tables, uh, weld mitt cut lists, welds, whole, and bill materials by popular demand. And then we're also going to talk about table templates, uh, where they're stored by default, uh, out of the box installation, and how to customize and create your own table templates, and give you a kind of an idea 
of uh, you know maybe a best practice for managing your tables. Uh, start out with just with anatomy of a table, so we're all talking uh, the same language here. Uh, the header is really the title uh, for the table. Uh, you are going to be able to hide and show the header. Cells, just like Excel, an individual cell, row, uh, grid lines, border lines, and columns. Uh, that terminology is pretty universal between Excel and, and SolidWorks at this point. Now, I'm actually using SolidWorks 2012. It's actually released now on the web. Uh, but I wanted to give you a sense of all the different table types that we're now up to. I'm only covering a few of these today, which I've kind of isolated here. Um, but you can see a couple new ones, uh, or one new one, the punch tables for 2012. But bend tables, title blocks, design tables, all of these have very, very similar functionality uh, in similar tools. Now, the first step in learning all of the SOLIDWORKS tables is to be able to handle and understand the various toolbars that are going to pop up. The one that you're going to use most often is the table, cell, row, and column toolbar. Now, it's exactly what it says it is. If you pick a table, if you pick a cell, if you pick a row, or you pick a column, there's a standard toolbar that will pop up that has functionality and I'm going to go through each of the individual icons for that. Okay. On top of that, there's common functionality between all table types. First of all, the ability to drag them with a pointer with your mouse. Holding down the Alt key is an option. Snapping to anchor points, and we're going to cover each of these individually. Snapping to lines and vertices in the sheet format, how do we make that happen? They all have the ability to use standard or custom templates. Standard meaning out of the box from SOLIDWORKS or templates that you've created. They all have the ability to add columns and rows and adjust their dimensions. They all, you, you can select and delete tables, columns, and rows in all of the table types. You can split and merge tables. So if you have a long bill of material you want to split it you can do so and you can also merge them back together. You can merge and split cells as long as they are adjacent to each other. Sorting is available in all the tables. The ability to zoom to selection using the view uh, zoom tool and then the ability to control the table in layers, move it to a particular layer. And what they've finally gotten to uh, over the last couple of releases is the ability to use tab and arrow navigation of the tables themselves. So let's just pop over to SOLIDWORKS for a moment. Let's start talking about the column, row, table, uh, cell toolbars. Now, exactly as I said, if you select a column, you're presented with a toolbar. If I select a row, it's the exact same toolbar. If I select a cell, I get that toolbar. Okay, and if I select the table itself, I also get that toolbar. So this toolbar is universal. You're going to find it in any of those four locations, but I want to go through the functionality on that toolbar just to make sure everyone is clear. Now, the ability to use the document font, as we go on in this lunch and I'm going to show you where some of the font settings are for the different table types. They are already predefined for the, the document template. Now, that being said, uh, your templates for your tables also have uh, font settings to them, and we're going to talk about that as we go. Now, the ability to adjust your alignment both vertically and horizontally is the next six icons. So if you want to right, left, justify, or center, there is the option to rotate. Let's say I wanted to take this column or a particular cell, and I wanted to rotate it. Uh, unfortunately, the rotate only allows for 90-degree increments. So if you continue to hit it, it will rotate 90 degrees. Notice it does not uh, reset the cell size if you were to do so. Now, the ability to fit text. Uh, there are times uh, when you're going to modify a cell size and the text no longer fits within the, the cell itself. 
what this will do is without changing the font, it will shrink down uh, the text, kind of collapse the spacing down so it does fit the cell. And that's what that option is. If I wanted to merge cells, okay, um, I would select the two cells I want to merge. In this case, uh, in a build material table, I'm not, I'm not doing that because I have data in there. But you have the ability to merge the two cells into one, and then there's the option to unmerge the cells. Okay. Uh, we do have the ability to do equations in both general tables and bill material tables. That is available on here. Then we have our options for horizontal padding and vertical padding. This is essentially the spacing outside of the text data, the, the spacing beyond the uh, font characters. And you can control that globally or individually to a cell row or column. Okay, uh, column property, let me just uh, select a column here. If you select column property, uh, it's actually bringing up the linked property from the file. Uh, so we have the ability to create parametric links between the tables and the information in the individual parts. This is where you'll get to that. Uh, we have the ability to hide or show columns or rows. Now this is kind of neat because if I select hide or show, uh, my cursor changes to what we're familiar with in the SolidWorks environment, this, uh, this half moon uh, image here. Uh, if I now select on any column or row, I'm able to hide that. Anything that is currently listed as hidden will be in blue. So it's kind of like toggling them on or toggling them off. Okay, once you exit this hide show, that column will disappear. Now if I select hide show again, anything that was hidden will then be shown and you can toggle it on or toggle it off using this. Now SolidWorks annotations works exactly the same way. If you're in a drawing, you use hide show annotations, the same symbol is going to come up, you're going to get the same kind of results. Okay, so that's your, your hide show. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at the next option is to specify whether you want your table header on the top or table header on the bottom. It's just a toggle. Okay. Uh, the last one uh, is what allows you to group and ungroup multiple rows. So if I wanted these two rows of any of these tables, to stay grouped together. In other words, if I try to reorder or I try to uh, modify uh, the, the, no, the, the values of these cells, they will move together. So this allows me to kind of group them. Uh, that way, if I were to do any kind of movement here, this one isn't set to reorder. We'll talk about why I can't reorder here. But now, if I were able to reorder, um, this they would stay together, and they would be forced to stay together based upon the grouping. Now you can actually do an ungroup as well. Uh, that will again allow you to pick the cells and, and ungroup them. Okay, this toolbar uh, will get you through uh, most of the table functionality as far as formatting. Okay, now let's talk about some of the standard items. Uh, that are common among all the tables. First of all, the ability to drag with your pointer. When you activate a table, uh, the first indication uh, or ability to select the table is really being done with this uh, four direction arrow in the corner here. If I mouse over that, that's what I use to select the entire table using my mouse. Uh, by left mousing on that, I do have the ability to drag the table. Now, what most people forget is if you hold down your Alt key, you can select anywhere on the table and drag it. Okay, so the Alt key is kind of important uh, if you're moving things around constantly. Now, let's talk a little bit about anchor points. Uh, each table, and we're going to go through this a little bit, has an option attached to an anchor point. 
Now, what is an anchor point? I'm going to first go into my sheet format of this drawing. I can find any point on the sheet format. I know it's a point because SOLIDWORKS gives me the feedback that it is. I'm going to use the top rightmost point, and I'm going to right-click on it, and you're going to see an option called Set as Anchor. Now, what this is is a predefined point used for the different table types so that when you drop a table, you can automatically position it by using what we call the anchor point. So this table I'm using happens to be bill of materials, so let me go ahead and set this as the bill of material anchor, and I'll go ahead and uh, exit my sheet format here. Okay, now, just to show you how that works, if I go off to the uh, bill material options here and select attached to anchor point, it's going to go ahead and automatically snap that table uh, to the anchor point. Now, there is, and, and recently was added in the last couple of releases, a method of seeing what anchor points have been defined. Now, if I expand the sheet format on the sheet, you will see a list of all the anchors. If I click on the anchors, you'll see, and as you see, I select Bill Material Anchor, a little black dot shows up here in the corner showing me that's where my Bill Material Anchor will uh, will be used. Okay, and again, uh, if they are not, you can see my weldment cutlass anchors all the way to the to the very edge of the sheet. So that's a way of looking to see where the anchors already been applied. Now we also have the ability to snap the lines in the sheet format. Now this is just something that happens automatically. Uh, you notice as I'm mousing over I can actually snap the points in the in the part file but as I get down here notice it will snap to any of the geometry uh, on the sheet format this is just default functionality uh, simply because a lot of times your anchor point uh, is related uh, to the sheet format in some way uh, or is a point or location on the sheet format so if you wanted uh, let's say your bill, bill materials to be somewhere out in the graphics area, but not quite to the corner. What I can do is I can edit my sheet format. Maybe I put a uh, a line or something in here, very small line. Uh, you may want to hide that, but I'm going to show that just for illustration purposes. And now I could come in and use that. See how it snaps right to it. So if you needed to position it a certain distance off the corner or you can see the corners of that bill material now snaps uh, real nicely. And again, this I'm talking bill of materials here uh, for my example, uh, but most of them, all the tables will follow this. Now, standard and custom templates, I'm going to hold that topic to the end. We're going to go through that uh, in depth. Now, adding columns and rows are very simple. Uh, the method for doing that and the method for doing a lot of the next things that I'm showing you are through the right-click menu on the table itself. So not, not using your formatting toolbar for columns, rows, cells, but to right-click, uh, you have the ability, first off, to insert columns and rows. If I go to the Insert menu, you can select, do I want a column right or left, do I want a row above or below the one that I selected? Okay, this will be on all tables on the right-click menu. Now, you also have the ability to do some selections based upon selecting a column or a row. Now, what you've been seeing me do is select the column header or select the row header to pick the row. But if I were to right-click on a single cell, I can say select the row, and that selects the entire row for that item. Now, there is also an extra selection in here for selecting the entire table. Now this one's fantastic if you want to maybe, let's say, adjust the padding or format something for the entire table, maybe your justification or change your font. Uh, it makes it real easy to make your selections using your right-click menu. Now if I want to split a table, all the table types do have the ability, if I right-click on any cell or row, um, I have the ability to split them horizontally above my selection, horizontally below my selection, 
vertically left, vertically right. I'm going to say horizontally below. Now this gives me two tables that are formatted together, have the same options. But now I can move them to different places uh, on the sheet if need be. Now if I wanted to, I can right click on any of these separate tables that I now have and you're going to have the option to merge those tables back together. Okay. Now, merging cells. If I right click select two cells, right click you're going to have an option to merge and the opposite of that is to unmerge. This is uh, you know, a good example where you might use a single description to describe uh, two separate components. If I wanted to unmerge those, uh, it will then uh, go back and get the metadata from the individual files. Now the ability to sort. Let's say I wanted to sort on description. Uh, let's use part number. Let's select sort. Now there's different things that we can sort on. First thing the software is going to present me is a, uh, a list of the item headers or the headers for the table for me to sort on. Am I sorting on item number, part number, description, and quantity? In this case, let's say we want to sort on part number. Do we want it in ascending or descending order? I can then give it a secondary sort option, then sort it by description in ascending order. Now, how do I want to group the items, parts and assemblies together? Okay and then I can actually move them up and down uh, if parts go first, assemblies first, and so on. Okay, and you can see that it reorganized. Now I want you to notice that it also reorganized the item number, so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go a little bit later. Now for those of you uh, who are familiar with layer dialog, let's go ahead and pop on my layer tool here. Uh, for any of the tables that you have, you will have the ability at the bottom of the options to specify the layer that you want to use uh, for the table. Now I'm going to go a little bit more in depth in this as we get into the individual options. Uh, last common functionality between the two, uh, the ability to tab an arrow between cells. If I grab a cell, if I hit tab, it's going to take me to the next cell. Okay, if I use my arrow keys, I can now go between the cells as well. This is something that seems trivial, uh, but hasn't been there for very many releases. So it acts a lot more like the Excel functionality uh, that you've seen in the past. So first two things, cell, column, row, and table toolbars, and your common functionality, most of which is found in the right-click menu. Let's go back here. Let's start talking about general tables. Uh, general table is typically used when you need to type in data rather having it rather than having it generated automatically. When we say generated automatically, it's that linking to the custom properties uh, that you don't necessarily have to have in a general table. Uh, general tables do require user input for all cells. Okay, and there is a general table document property option. Okay, so let's go here. Now in 2012, you're going to notice some things are a little different, so you're going to get a little taste of what it's like in 2012 here. This is an example out of the, the training book here. Let's say we have this part coming in many different sizes, and I wanted to, instead of using a design table and filling it out, I may want to create a, a general table. So we're going to use three dimensions on here to illustrate uh, you know, things like thickness. Get the other edge here. Okay, now we override these dimension values uh, with the actual name of the dimension. Okay, we have the ability to uh, go ahead and modify the dimension name. And why am I losing it? Okay. 
Now, having these dimensions on here show me one configuration, but let's insert a table. Uh, first of all, the insert tables, you can find it under the insert tables dialog. Notice there's general, whole, build materials. We're covering the regular SOLIDWORKS build materials today. You have your Excel base, which is old functionality. Some of you may be still using that. We can talk about that. Uh, revision tables, design tables, cut lists, weld tables, bend tables, punch tables, and then there's, uh, for the routing package, some of the electrical. Let's start out with our general table. Now, one thing you'll notice about all the tables is they all have their own property manager that gives information about formatting for that table. It's unique to each table type. So what always confused me is it seemed like it was always different, but it's really just different to the type of table that you want. Now, we will need to select a table template. In this case, I don't have a template for my general tables. Uh, this option here uh, allows me to browse to my favorites location or my tables location to make a selection. It's kind of like the browse to button but it takes you to your option. I'll, I'll show a little bit more than that. Uh, there is no anchor point set on this particular drawing. You can see I cannot select attach to anchor point. If there is no anchor point set on the drawing, you cannot do so. Now I can specify in here the number of columns I want, the number of rows I think I want. Okay. Uh, and then we get to dealing with the border. Now notice how this says use document settings and it already has the border sizes. I'm going to show you into show you the document settings location for this. And as I stated before, the ability to have layer control on any of these tables. If I knew or created a layer in my template that was always used for balloons and tables, so I can turn them on and turn them off, I could just pick my tables layer in here and it would make it a lot easier. And it would also allow me to control the color of the table. Uh, using that method. Okay, so I told that I want a four row, four column table here. Now, notice it snapped to the corner because of my common table functionality. Now, here's where I might want to uh, control the entire size of the table. So I select the table using format table, format entire table. I can control what I want the default column width and default row height to be. Let's say my row height I want 0.25 and my column width I want at 2 inches. Okay, that allows me to set the sizes. Now from here, some of the differences that we'll see. If you right click on the table, where you start to see the differences between tables in SOLIDWORKS, one, you'll see a difference in the property manager that I talked about. Now you can get back to that property manager by clicking that arrow in the upper left-hand corner. That property manager will come back up. So that's the first place you'll notice a difference. The second place is depending on the table type, you'll have more or less options on your right-click menu. So in this case, we have all of our insert column selection, the ability to delete the table. There's some formatting options for column row width. You can even lock the row height or formatting the entire table. Okay. Uh, and let's take a look. Now that we've placed the table, if we look at our property manager, we actually have uh, one other option uh, that shows up here. And this is only showing up now because there was no attached to anchor point option that would show up earlier in the process. It's what we call a stationary corner. A stationary corner is used to tell the software what direction it's going to expand when you go adding a column or a row. Now, if you want the top right hand top left hand corner to stay stationary, so when you add a column or row, it's going to build it down and over to the right. That's where this stationary corner comes into play. If I select top right as stationary corner, and I decide to do an insert column to the right or left, doesn't matter. See how it expands off to the left because my stationary corner was to the right. Okay. 
So stationary corner is just used for expansion, and that shows up after you've placed the general table, only because of the anchor point options. Now in this particular case, I now have the ability to go to each of the cells and just start typing something. Let's say we're, we're showing a table with length, width, and height here. Now notice when I'm in editing a cell, I get a slight variation of the formatting uh, toolbar. Just a slight variation. It still has font and justification options, but a couple other options that we have in here now that we're actually editing text. I have the ability to link to property. In other words, I'm linking to a custom property in a part or assembly, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. Do I want to put a symbol in this cell that I'm working on? This takes you right to your symbol libraries. So maybe I want to put a weld symbol in here. I can actually access my weld symbol, and it will place it right in there. I can change the color of the font in this particular cell. I can also stack data. Uh, let's say I'm putting in uh, length or some data. You have the ability to stack uh, the upper and lower data, almost like tolerances. Okay. Uh, we can do bullets, either bullet points and numbering, and then we can have decrease or increase indent. So if we had a very large cell, which we had you know, multi-line worth of information with bullets and, and information, uh, we can increase or decrease the indent to change the bullet and numbering, just like you do in Word. Okay, so slight variation here. Uh, what am I missing? Okay, and maybe over here I want part numbers, something very simple. And I can fill out the metadata from here. Okay, so general tables, very simple. Last thing I want to show you is if you right-click on the table, all tables will have this, the ability to save as. Now, the default format for a general table is SLD TBT. It's a table template. Now, in the end, we're going to talk about how to manage all these, but I wanted to just point out the, the extension type. Notice you can also save this as Excel formats, a text file, or a CSV directly out of these tables. Okay? So there's a general table. Let's talk a little bit about revision tables. Uh, inserting a revision table into a drawing will allow you to track revisions and allow you to uh, deal with revision symbols. It does have some automation as far as setting properties uh, within the system as well. All right, let's go ahead and uh, launch SolidWorks for a minute here. Um, first thing I want to show you, I've kind of skipped over a little bit with general tables, but if I go to my tools options under document properties, you're going to see uh, a header for tables. This is where you set the default values for the different table types. First of all, let's take a look at the general tables. General tables allow me to control the border, the font of the general table, how it deals with leading and trailing zeros, and then what default layer is it going to be on. Notice I had to pick the layer manually but using my document properties, I can specify it always goes on the table layer. Okay. Uh, for my revision table, let's look at this one. Same thing, border size, and all this is is a pull-down menu for thickness. Our font to be used. But now we have some more options here. What symbol shape do I want to use by default? You can see as I shift over from one drafting standard to another, uh, it does let me know that this is not is no longer the base ANSI standard. What is the alphanumerical control? Am I using ABCs or one two threes? Okay, if I'm using one two threes, do I start from where the user left off? In other words, the user types in Rev 16, or 
changing all of them so they meet starting at one, two, three. Okay, we're going to stay with ABCs. Now, probably the most important set of options for revision control in here uh, is the multi-sheet style. The ability to have revision tables on multiple sheets and how they interact with each other. If my multi-sheet style is set to C sheet one, uh, any any other sheet other than the one with the revision table on it will just have one line that says C sheet one. If I set linked, then all pages in a drawing will have the same revision table. If I set independent, then all sheets in a drawing package will be independent revision tables, meaning that the, each page will have its own uh, revision table options. Okay, I'm going to set this to C sheet 1. So let's go ahead and insert a revision table. Another way to get to your tables, and probably the quickest way, is using your S key on your keyboard. S key is for your shortcut. At the end of that is your tables uh, flyout toolbar. So let's go ahead and add a revision table. Now a revision table, again, ask for a template. Do I want to attach it to an anchor point? I could check my sheet, see where my anchor point is in this case. What is the revision symbol? Notice it takes the default revision symbol. Uh, do I want to enable the symbol when adding revi new revision? I'm going to show you where that is when we get going. Now, using my document settings, in other words, I just showed you where the document settings for border and uh, grid border and grid uh, box border uh, thicknesses are, and then our layers. Okay, once I accept this, it places it automatically onto the sheet. Now, this template actually uses zone, rev, description, date, and approved. Now, once you've placed the table, your right-click menu is going to add. Like I said, the differences between these tables are typically between the, the custom property or the property window, I'm sorry, and the right-click menu. That's where there's going to vary slightly. So on the right-click menu for revisions, they've added a section for adding a revision. What this does, it takes today's date and the very first rev, which we said to start at A, and it fills out that, that new row. It then automatically activates the revision symbol. So I can place revision symbols at the location where the changes were made. Now once I'm done adding the revision symbols, I can then come in here and fill up the description of the change. Now here's an important thing to note. If I decide later on I need to add another revision symbol, and I go to the annotation toolbar and I grab revision symbol, whatever was set for that revision title block is what's going to come up as a revision symbol. So that's really getting its information from here. Okay, if I decided uh, to go to the table properties and change the revision symbol, okay, notice it doesn't change it here, but if I go to add a symbol, it's going to use whatever the options were for the table to add the symbol. So it's very important there. Now another thing to note. Let me just do a forced rebuild here. It also pushes the revision letter value uh, to the title block. So there is some linking to between the two. So if I were to add a second revision here, okay. Now, some people probably don't realize this, but uh, if it doesn't show up right away, all you need to do is, a for some reason, a forced rebuild uh, reads in those properties again. And that gives you what you need. Now, let's just take a look at any other differences between a revision table. On the right click, nothing really is different. In the custom property, uh, only a couple things. Uh, revision symbol shapes and options. Okay. So there's your revision table. Well, make cut list tables. Uh, we're not going to go into depth on how the cut list is created. I want to focus on table and table properties in this case. A well cut list table 
is for documenting your structural members, lengths, and materials, and other custom properties that you might have for those. And again, the weldment cut list has its own uh, document property location. So let's uh, look at that. I'm going to use the same drawing for welds and weld cut lists. Um, what I have here, if we open this up, uh, is a weldment uh, that has a bunch of welds already in it for me that are, that are already built. Now, just to refresh your memory, we're not going to go in depth on this, but the welded structural members in SOLIDWORKS is where the weldment cut list is derived from. That information is already uh, set in stone in the parts themselves. Now what you're really looking for when you create a weldment cut list is this symbol right here over top of the cut list icon. This tells you that the cut list is up to date. And that's what allows me to uh, do the work that I need to do uh, on those uh, drawings to add the tables. So let's start out with a weldment cut list table. Now it's a select the drawing view to specify the model. Now here's a little note about weldment cut list tables. You can actually insert multiple cut list tables in a single sheet. Multiple. Okay. Now there is a cut list template. We do have the same options for anchor point. Now when you create a weldment in SOLIDWORKS, there's two configurations, as machined and as welded. By default, the software is always going to create the cut list based upon the as welded configuration. Now, as welded is before you add any secondary features like cutouts or machining features uh, to the parts themselves. Now, uh, we're going to illustrate this option in the bill of materials. A lot of how a cut list works uh, is it's becoming very much similar to a bill of materials. So for instance, if I select keep missing item and tell the software to strike it out, if a structural member, let's say we've built the bill material, the drawing already exists, if a structural member gets deleted, it will remain in the bill of materials, but it will be it will be in uh struck out in the in the list. So there'll be a line right through the middle of the, the information. Where do I want my item numbers to start from? and then border and layer. Now before I go too much further, let's just place this. I want to go into the options for weldment cut list tables and you'll notice there are none. Okay, uh, most of the information or the default uh, comes from the bill of material uh, options. Okay. So this is where it's getting the default properties for the weldment cut list. A couple things I want to point out in the weldment cut list. First of all, let's take a look at any differences in the property manager. Uh, I showed you the strikeout. Uh, there is a section for item numbers, and, and it went ahead and, and filled out item numbers. But there's an option here, do not change item numbers. Uh, because a weldment cut list acts a lot like a bill material, we have the ability to reorder. So watch what happens when I reorder. Uh, you'll notice in this case, item number three did, get, did not get renumbered. Now if I turn off the option do not change item numbers, you can see that it, it renumbered the system, renumbered the file. So if I take number two and make it somewhere further down the line, it's going to go ahead and renumber that particular item. This is bill material functionality kind of built right into uh, Weldment Cutlass. Now, also on your right click menu uh, is very similar uh, to what we're dealing with in all the other tables. Insert, select, delete, formatting, sort, and split. Now, if I look at the Save As dialog, notice we got a different template extension, SLD. WLD TBT. Now I'm showing this simply because I want we'll go back in the end and take a look at all the different format types uh, and deal with those separately. 
Other than that, all of the information, the ability to add headers and rows uh, is going to be very similar to build materials, so I'm going to show a lot of that in the build material side. Now, since this uh, weld mitt has welds on it as well, I want to add the weld table. But before I do that, let's take a look at how the weld mitts treat welds inside of a part or assembly file. Now these are lightweight, they're not even part files, they're really more of a visual representation of the weld. They're, they're added using the weld bead functionality inside of SOLIDWORKS. Uh, we're going to be covering this in, uh, in great depths in two weeks in the Weldments webinar. However, uh, when they're added, you'll get a weld folder. That weld folder is kind of like a cut list, but for the welds themselves. Uh, this allows you to organize and set properties for the welds. When I say set properties, we have the ability to specify the material used for the weld, the process used, is it MIG TIG welding, uh, mass per unit length, the cost per unit mass, you know, how much time does it take per for a suit per a certain unit length, how many passes does it take, and it gives you kind of some costing information uh, related to this. Now, the only reason I bring this up is because we're going to use this in the tables. So some of this has already been specified uh, in my particular drawing. So again, using my S key, I bring up tables, and I have the option for a weld table. Again, looking for a template anchor point, which configuration I want to use. Uh, notice this is the as machined configuration. By default, this will use the as machined uh, simply because you may do weld prep. You add other features uh, to prep the weld location and then add the weld to that. So a lot of times they want the uh, secondary features in there. Now, another important and neat, uh, neat little option here. Do you want the software to include any drawing annotations? In other words, if you already placed a weld symbol note on the drawing, do you want the software to look at that and add that to the weld table automatically? Okay. What are my start and end or start and increment for the item numbers? And then as we said, your border and layer. Now there is an, uh, an option section for uh, weld tables, so let's just go there real quick. Document properties, weld. We really are only controlling the border size by default, the layer, the font, and then what we do with trailing zeros. Now for those of you who have a question about what it means to set your trailing zeros to smart, is it will essentially round or trim to the whole to whole values to meet the ANSI or ISO standard, depending on what standard you have set. So uh, it really tries to adhere to the standard if you do use that. So here we have our, our table. Now this one's slightly different. Uh, if I right click on the table, I have insert, select, delete, hide, and format. Okay, notice how I lose some of the sorting. Uh, I don't have the ability to reorder them, as you can see in this case. Okay, if I select the header, I can, and this is by double clicking the header, I can actually get access to other custom properties related to that weld. Now you saw me go to the property dialog and there was thing like mass, cost, time per unit area, I can get to all of that stuff from here. Okay, now let's look at the table properties. Okay, the only other option I want to point out here is combine same weld type. So everything that is the same type, which is in this case every uh, five millimeter fillet weld, now all gets grouped together and gives you a total length, a weld length. Okay, so that that uh, we'll bring those separately. Okay, so very simple. And again, these 
tables have their own formats. So if I were to do a save as, you can see I'm now dealing with a WLD TBT, just like we did with weldments. Okay, so those are very similar. Whole tables. Uh, whole tables are used to document the size and location of all holes on a face or faces. Uh, again, there is a location for whole table properties that you can get to in your document properties section. So let's get rid of this for a moment. And here's an example for the whole table. And again, if I use my S key, grab my tables, we'll select whole table. Ask for a template like all the other table types. It asks if I want to attach it to an anchor. You can see that there must be an anchor assigned because it is available to me. Then I have the ability to number the holes that it recognizes either using alpha characters or numerical characters. Now a whole table is going to give you a list of all the holes from a particular datum location. So here's where we specify that datum. I might pick the corner of the model and then we can use these boxes to select which direction is my x-axis, which direction is my y-axis. I'm going to take the defaults. We then specify what faces or edges uh, contain the holes. It's basically going to look on those faces for all holes and how they were defined. Now how they were defined is important. You're going to see that in a little bit here. At the bottom, we have the ability to select what border and layer. And then there actually is another option in here that I'm going to use. I've defined the whole table based upon one particular top view. However, I may have holes on another view, in this case the right view, that I want to also document. If I select next view, I can then place another datum Okay, and select another face location. And the software, when I'm done selecting all the different faces and datums, will combine the, all of this together into one single whole table. Okay, now notice all the tags uh, are listed in a single table regardless of what face they belong to. Really the key to this is the X and Y location are based upon the datum for the face you selected. So this datum is for these two holes and this datum is for the rest. Now let's take a look at the options for a whole table. Now there's quite a bit in here. Uh, our standard border text layer. Now we can control the precision of the location dimensions move out of here so my X and Y locations my default alphanumerical control I can combine same tags same size what show a little bit of this as well uh, show ANSI inch letter and number drill sizes let's say the holes were defined using the hole wizard well the hole wizard you can pick a, an ANSI inch letter or number drill size like a number 40 drill and it will actually use that value here in the table. Um, if these, but it has to be defined with the whole wizard. Okay. Uh, what we use for leading and trailing zeros. A few other options here: showing the whole centers, automatic update of the whole table. In other words, if I delete a tag, uh, does it automatically update and renumber? Can I reuse deleted tags? In other words, if I deleted it, it renumbers the previous value. Uh, add new row at the end of the table for typing in any extra uh, tags that you might have. How I want the origin locator to show up on the drawing. Uh, the tag angle or offset from the actual hole. If you look at uh, the positioning of the tags, you can see uh, that it's at a 45 degree angle offset by this particular value. And again, these are all set as document properties and defaults. Now we can also control dual dimensions. 
Do I want dual dimensions? How do I want those to display top, bottom, right, or left of the original value? Do I want to show the units for the dual dimensions? Now, these are all the default document properties, but what I want to point out here with the whole table is pretty much most of those options can be changed using your right-click menu or going back to the property of the table, of the whole table itself. So things like combining same size, everything the same size gets combined. Uh, if I want to combine tags that are all uh, the same size location or size, uh, notice the location values go away because we're no longer locating one whole one hole uh, of a particular size. We're showing that there's four of this type of hole. And again, you can turn those on and off. If I expand tags, it will bring me back uh, to where I need to be. Uh, now, another neat one, if you got a really huge hole table, let's say um, I'm at B3, you have an option in here to jump to tag. Jump to tag takes you to the actual hole and highlights it so you can modify or uh, change the hole size at all. Um, as far as the tag is concerned, uh, the tag is really just a note that's automated, so if you wanted to change the font, you select the font or, or the note itself, uh, turn off use document font, and you can modify the color, leaders, and so on uh, from there. Okay. Uh, let's just take one last look at the properties. Uh, notice under scheme here, a lot of these options are just on the right-click menu. Uh, show ANSI inch is not there, but it's in the properties. Okay, whole precision's in the properties, not on the right click. I can turn on and off the origin indicator. I can turn on and off the tags using this visibility option as well. And uh, whole centers actually gives you a point located at the center of each hole. Uh, great if you wanted to dimension or attach a note to the center or something. Okay, so very, very similar in, in most aspects with the exception of a few right-click options. Now on to the, the final beast here. I know we're running out of time. Uh, bill materials. Uh, I want to cover a few things here in bill materials, most of which we've already covered. Uh, bill materials used for documenting parts list materials quantities. Users have control over what is shown in the final structure. Uh, and there is also a bill material table document property location. So my example for bill materials, you've probably seen this around for a while. Let's go ahead and hit my S key. We'll go ahead and select our bill of material. Uh, select the drawing view that contains the components. Now there is a considerable uh, addition of options when it comes to build materials and I'm going to try to hit each and every one of these. Uh, our standard template and anchor position. Now the type of build material am I dealing with top level only, top level parts and assemblies. Am I collapsing all the sub-assemblies and just showing all the parts? Or am I showing an indented bill? What you have selected here dictates uh, some of the options and some of your abilities. Okay, uh, And we're going to go back through most of these. Uh, I just want to show you at the bottom, border control, layer control, as we saw before. So let's go ahead and place that on. Now one of the things we haven't talked about is the ability to just mouse between the cells and you have the ability just to drag and resize using this method here. Okay, so if you wanted to give some more room in here, you could do that manually. Now, on a bill of materials, you're going to see a couple things that are unique. Um, first of all, off to the left-hand side, you're going to see these, uh, I call them spikes. Um, it, it's for a fly-out. If I select my spikes, it's actually going to fly out information about that bill of material. It's really showing me the structure, that this is a sub-assembly with one component, or we're dealing with top level. So we have three or five sub-assemblies and three or five upper level components in this case. Okay. 
Now, notice as I flip between the different BOM types that this changes slightly. Okay, this first of all, this list gets a little bit longer. If I go indented, I now have a little bit different uh, type of list. Now, let me just stay indented here for a moment because when we're in the indented mode, I do have the ability to choose which subassemblies I want to collapse down in my bill of materials. See the little minus sign here? I can go ahead and collapse down any subassemblies I desire. Okay, and I can do that uh, pretty easily. Uh, a couple other things I want to point out here. You do have the ability to reorder. Let's go through that a little bit. Uh, reordering is affected mostly uh, by the item number section uh, in your bill material options. Because I can choose to always follow the assembly order, assembly and subassembly order. For instance, if I select that and I tell it to follow the subassembly order as well, um, I lose my ability to reorder my bill of materials. You know, notice as I drag a row up and down, I lose that ability. Okay, if I go back to the properties and say, you know what, don't follow the subassembly order, what I should be able to do uh, is I should be able to reorder the subassemblies. That's not currently working. But if I turn off follow assembly order just for a moment, uh, just to show this, I can go ahead and reorder uh, the individual components. You can see I'm flip-flopping these. Now, one of the options in here is do not change item numbers. I showed you that on the weldment cut list. If I turn that on, uh, I can go ahead and flop those, and the item number does not get updated. Okay. Now, another thing to be aware of uh, with these bill materials uh, is the ability to, to handle and deal with uh, multiple configurations. So I'm just going to collapse this down for a moment and bring it to my corner so I have a little more space. Uh, there is a two sections that deal with configurations of an assembly and parts. First of all, um, when it comes to doing a top level only bill materials, I have the ability to show more than one configuration in a bill of materials. So I'm telling you, I have version one and version two of this assembly, I'm telling it to show both configurations. Now, by doing that, you'll notice that the each configuration is listed in its own header, and it shows the number of each component in that configuration. Now, let me take you down just a little bit further here. Um, this uh, keep missing item. There's an option in here. Uh, if you actually delete, and I talked about this a little bit with the weldments, if you delete a component, it actually will strike it out uh, in the bill of materials as well. Now, the other things you need to talk about a little bit, notice how uh, in my bill of materials I have item number 2 as QD plug and item number 12 is QD plug. Well, what's happening is I'm actually using two separate configurations one in each uh, configuration. Now here's where I tell the software what to do with that. When I'm dealing with part configurations, do I want to display as one item number? Uh, display configurations of the same part as separate items is what I have now. Display all configurations of the same part as one item. Notice if I select that, now everything goes under QD plug and it's all the one item versus having it listed separately. This is used a lot with uh, toolbox files, because toolbox files, it's the same part, but the configuration is different. So how do you want it to show on the bill of materials? OK. Now, a couple of the things that are important. Let's go back to the indented here. A couple of things you may not know that are even here. Uh, first of all, the ability to d d dissolve subassemblies. Um, if I did not want to show this as a subassembly and I just wanted to show all its components, 
if I right click on the subassembly in the flyout view, I have the ability to dissolve it. Now, now this is actually tied the to the do not change item numbers uh, because it will actually give item numbers to those three subcomponents uh, that we just elevated to another level. Now notice this diaphragm subassembly has what four components in here. Another option that you may not be aware of if I right click is the ability to get to component options. Now these are options that are stored in the configuration properties for the component itself or for the subassembly in this case. What is used for the part number? Is it document name, configuration name, or user specified? But also, what to do with the children of this subassembly? Do I want them shown in the bill of material? Do I want them hidden? There's also the option to promote them. I'm going to go ahead and promote them. In other words, you'll, you'll watch the diaphragm disappear and the other three components now become elevated to that next level, okay? And then we'll get numbers assigned to them. Now, when something has been promoted, hidden, or shown, or the uh, you know, organization of the structure has changed, you'll notice these sets of arrows at the very top. If you right-click on that cell, there's an option there to restore the restructured components. Okay, restoring the restructured components brings you right back. It shows you which subassemblies that you've restructured by promoting or demoting uh, the components, and it will actually reorganize that. Okay, so you do have some control there. Now, uh, this bill of materials isn't showing it, but you'll also, this is an older assembly, if the assembly's been saved recently, you'll be able to just mouse over each of these and get a, a graphical uh, picture of what the component is. Now another thing, on the right click, uh, you can actually get to the option exclude from bill of materials from here as well. If I select exclude from bomb, it brings me up a little message, okay, and it actually excludes it. Well, the real deal here is, let me open the component here. Should be able to open it right from my right click. Uh, if I go to the, uh, I actually want to go to the subassembly here. Let's go back. If I open this up for a moment, and I go to the component properties for any one of these parts, you have the option to exclude from BOM. What I just showed you through using the right click method was a quicker way of getting to the exclude from BOM. Okay, quicker and easier uh, way of getting there. Uh, a couple other things. These cells in a bill material, this is linked to the custom property for description. If I wanted to uh, I could look at this and say, oh, nobody's filled out the description in the individual parts. So I could come in here maybe to this exhaust cap, open it up, go to my file properties, fill up my description, and when I go back to the drawing, my description's filled out. But even better than that, people, I don't know if people realize, but you can double-click a cell that's linked, and it's going to tell you that the cell is linked and give you some options. Do you want to keep the link to the custom property, or do you want to break the link and override the value? I'm going to keep the link, but maybe I want to give this a valve body. I give it some description that's filled out. Now, if I open that part, you'll notice that it actually is bidirectional. It actually filled out the description valve body as a configuration specific property. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to show here, I know I went through a lot, is uh, 
just a reminder that our uh, bill material can be done inside the assembly as well. So if I want to insert tables, bill of materials, I can do that right inside the assembly file. Again, using the templates, my bomb options, all the options that we saw in a drawing, and I can actually place the bill of materials directly in the assembly view. Now, a couple of the things are going to be unique here, because we do have to be able to scale that uh, to meet our requirements inside the assembly. So changing your font sizes, changing your spacing, cell padding, and so on uh, is all going to be available here. Okay, now once that bill's in here, this could be configured exactly uh, like you would on a drawing. Um, you can also, if you right click on that bomb, uh, you can show that table in a new window and actually view the bomb and edit the bomb uh, slightly differently by using separate windows. This will be great with 2012 because we have true multi-monitor support so you can have your bomb on one side and the assembly on the other. Now last conversation I want to have is about uh, templates. If I go to my tools options under file locations we have the ability to set locations for all the different template types. Notice there's my Ben table, Bond templates, uh, let's see, all the rest of them in here as well. Punch table, revision table, sheet metal tables, title block weld, they all have separate locations. Now by default uh, all the templates are stored in the Lang English folder. So if I go to my computer Go to Program Files, go to SolidWorks Corp, SolidWorks Lang English. You'll find all of your, your templates are stored in this particular folder, the ones that come out of the box. But how do I create my own templates to be used? Now very simply, let me go back to my drawing for a moment. When you modify or set a bill of material like inserting a column uh, that column is linked to let's say uh, uh, let's see folder name where something exists and you want this to be your bill of material when you do a save as okay you're gonna save out the SLD BOM table template now, as I showed you, all the different tables kind of have their own extension for table templates. So here's what I've done, and I think this will hopefully be useful. What I've done is I've organized all of my SOLIDWORKS libraries. For those of you who watched my library webinar, I have a separate location called SOLIDWORKS libraries where I have everything that is customizable in SOLIDWORKS. And what I've done there is I've put all of my templates for my tables, for for instance, revision tables, I have my rev table templates all stored out there. The problem with having them in the installation directory is uh, if you're modifying them and saving them, uh, when you go to from release to release, you're not exactly uh, keeping track of what's uh, what's been changed and so on. Uh, so I recommend creating uh, something similar to what I have here. A location where you can store everything and then you point SOLIDWORKS to your location. Okay, uh, That's what I had to show. I know we went kind of way over today. I guess I picked too many table options here. Uh, if there's any questions, post them in the questions dialog. Uh, if you have any other comments uh, related to the webinar, you can feel free to email me at kevin at caddimensions.com. Um, Again, what I'm hoping you got out of this is the whole idea that really all the tables are the same. You're looking at the document properties, the table properties, and the right-click menu, uh, and you'll find all the option, options related to those particular tables. I hope this was helpful. I hope you picked up a few tips and tricks, and uh, we'll see you next webinar. If there's not any questions, uh, we're going to... Uh,
Looks like people want to cover design tables. I will make sure we hit that in a lunch and learn uh, probably uh, early next month. Thanks for your time.